Welcome to Goyal Hav. Today with me, I am so privileged to be joined by Tashani Doshi, who is a poet, writer of fiction novels and um, a dancer. Um, she is also of Welsh Gujarati heritage and is currently living in Tamil Nadu. Um, and we are sort of, um, Tashani's going to say hi now, but sort of internet connection wise, we're not on the strongest one today. So we're actually going to turn off our videos and the rest of this after a quick hello. <laughs> will be an audio um, event. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi everyone, nice to join you. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to talking. A hello to both of these gorgeous poetry books. So what we're going to focus on today is um, these two copies. So um, A God at the Door is only recently come out with Blood Axe. Um, literally, was it a month ago? Yeah. Yeah. And then um, a girl, Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods is the first time I found your work um, sort of a few years ago. And so we're going to focus mostly on poetry for today. And I think the um, first question I wanted to bring up is that your poetry is, it has empathy at its heart. It's almost challengingly empathetic, I think. Um, it is... Um, looking at sort of human capability um, in all that senses, but has a sort of a fun, I feel like there is like a fundamental belief in there that um, humans are fundamentally good, even when they're bad, and that when they're bad, they're forced into doing bad things. And that there is this sort of um, love of humanity that pervades your poems. That's, uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I think that's an interesting um, idea to start with the idea of empathy. Um, and it's, it's interesting that you use the word good and bad. I don't necessarily think of those um, when I write or in my life as I think that we're all flawed as people, but I just think that we're all capable of um, incredible amounts of violence, but also beauty. And I think that the poems are a way to bridge this sense of what I would say is worrying about human beings or what I find distressing our, 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 our movement towards violence, our movements to cruelty towards other people, towards the planet, towards other creatures. And yet at the same time, we also have this capacity for tenderness, for creating beauty, for caring for each other. And so I think those modes are, are the two things that I'm always trying to negotiate. Um, and, and, and then the poem is a way of, I suppose, reconciliation, you know? Um, and so that sense of, the sense to me is not just that we are, the, the good prevails or anything like that, but more that we, we live in the shadows rather than entirely in the light or in the dark and that that's the place that we need to get used to um yeah if that yeah. makes any sense oh it makes complete sense <laughs> absolutely and it sort of and then it, it feels like it sort of ties into the fact that there's um the world the world of your poetry is maybe one in which like I feel like your philosophy in A God at the Door is there is this largely indifferent cosmos that we live in and the university, the universe that we sort of sit in is in some ways a, a very cruel world and that the only thing humans have is other humans and if we don't have sort of faith in each other then what do we have left? Would you say that's a sort of a compliment to that? Is that something that... Um, you, you're trying to do as well um yeah I think that the idea of, of one of the big ideas of this book was the sense of how do we find connection and what does it mean to be a person living on this planet at this moment and this idea of connecting micro and macro is very important to me I see the cosmos as something very um, I mean, terrifying in some way, but very beautiful and very empowering. That idea of 
no matter how small we are, we are part of it. And that sense of wanting to find ways in which we can be a part of it. I think that um, art is definitely one of those ways, uh, whether it's through music or literature or performing arts or painting or whatever it is. I think those are those moments of inspiration and breath where we really pause and we feel we're connected backwards in time or forwards in time or extending out in different directions. And we get to be outside of our bodies. And, and, and there are lots of instances and, you know, spirituality, people have different paths to that, different modes. And, and I think that's something that I'm interested in because it feels like we're in such state of ruin sometimes when we listen to the news and when we're looking around at the world today going through this pandemic as we have been mm -hmm. and then what are our avenues to recover or to remake something and so I really see us as you know um, as, as, as a sort of species that has caused a lot of destruction um, but then that also is able to make these connections. So again, that sense of duality of accepting that this is who we are, but also saying, well, because this is how we are, can we not also be this other part of ourselves? Yeah, absolutely. I, that feels like a, a thread that runs through so many. Um, sort of, you know, I, there's a, there was a quote in... Um, Oh, it's not coming here. I think it's south now, but the, the quote was, um, we all want to be monuments, but can't help shoving our fingers in the dirt. And I feel like yeah. that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, exactly like that just encapsulates um, everything that you were just saying. Um, how sort of was it writing this poetry collection? Like, was it a sort of different experience from uh, the girls running out of the woods? Was it sort of very much like feel like felt like a continuation of your other poems previously? Yeah, I think that the poems for me are a sort of never ending project. I, I think the, there are always changes and shifts tonally registers concerns a lot of the concerns remain the same you know the body is something I'm very interested in um, but I would say that this book particularly um, really uh, a lot of it was inspired by news stories and news headlines and things that I was reading about I feel like when I began writing poetry I I was moving from things, I was beginning with things that I was dealing with. You know, I, I was writing in my 20s and I felt that the movement and trajectory of writing was from the inside out uh, towards the world. And mm -hmm. now I feel that it's from the world in inwards. And so there's, a, there's been a shift of where the poems are beginning and where the inspirations come from. And I feel like I've also been trying to grapple with what it means to have this continuous news cycle and with all of these bombardments and how do we hold all of this and so the poems really a lot of them are inspired by by events mm -hmm. um by things people have said or done um and they are also yeah moving out from the world and then into my body rather than the other way around and, and i think it's just a different way of looking i suppose but also you know uh, maybe the same just shifting the perspective a little bit mm, absolutely I, I really like that analogy and I think that um there's an interesting use of specifics like specific events specific references to sort of be these placeholders for the wider conversation as it sort of ebbs and flows and changes um I think that that's something I really like about your poetry um that it sort of is a very much of the moment but also isn't <laughs> yeah I mean I wanted to I think poetry is something that can be very elastic very immediate responding uh, to the now that we're living in. Um, it's possible to do that in a way that I find it's hard to do uh, with 
you know, say a short story or a novel, which yeah. requires a much longer gestation period. But I, it was also very important for the poems to have or to retain a sense of the lyrics. I felt like I wanted them to be able to exist outside of that news headline, outside of the now, um, to be in a different time zone or to be in two time zones, you know, the, the now and then the lyrics and, and to say that there, there always have been poems like that. And I think that those are challenging because while they might speak directly to something that we can all, uh, you know, a reader of the moment would understand what I'm talking about, the poem should also be able to have an afterlife, you know, um, without all that uh, construction work of this is the headline and this is the story and this is the response, etc. So, yeah, yeah, and um, absolutely, because it, it and it's yeah, it rarely is a news story. Also, the sort of it's maybe like the um, what's the word like a sort of access into a story rather than like actually the the emotions at the core yeah. of the story. I mean, when I wrote Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods, the title poem for my last collection, that was a response to, you know, a big story in India, which was the rape of Jyoti Singh in Delhi on a bus in December 2012. And that story captured the world and it changed the way that we talked about um, women's rights, gender mm -hmm. violence in this country changed a lot of things and yet still so many things are unchanged, not just in India but around the world, because that poem that I wrote out of that incident has now been used for so many women and girls who have come after her. I mean, more, more most recently Sarah Everard, you know, and so I think you write a poem out of a particular moment and then the poem uh, in this case, for me, it's unfortunate because I wish that I didn't have to resuscitate that poem or anybody didn't have to go to it. But the fact is that gender violence continues. And so that poem is used as a kind of um, as a kind of battle cry uh, again and again and again. And basically the demand is that we need to change and we need to, to stop this violence towards women and girls and violence in general, I would add. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think some of those poems I have really enjoyed of yours. You know, I think the sort of um, what Mr. Frog taught me about Me Too. Um, and more than that, I think I would quite like to come back to sort of, you mentioned that you write about the body a lot. And there's a lot I really have related to in how you write about the body and in particular how we're like we're guided to feel bad about our body that it's sort of a distraction from um that it's sort of it's a it's a distraction from our life and I think one of the um the things that girls are coming out of the woods is trying to say is that sort of um Hume, the key to human happiness is a reduction in distractions it's to and sort of a reduction in material goods and to sort of look internally and be on that journey of self-realization and in like a much more concrete poem um the ode to patrick swayze <laughs> <laughs> it's i was i think i'd just been thinking a lot recently and then i read the poem and then it sort of felt to me that this is a message I can't hear too many times because so many times as women, we are constantly told um, what we should want, what sort of sexuality, romantic relationship, how you need a man, what you, you know, what sort of the way in which your life should look like. And that even when you sort of have done some of the work to unpack that and to think about what you actually want, I still can't hear that message too many times. Like it's almost as if how reinforced you are that the first message is I now need to hear sort of the message that this isn't necessary for a happy life. I also need to hear that one constantly to be able to like live it to the same extent. Um, and I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about why the body is um, important for you to write about. You know, because I, um... I worked as a dancer and I still 
think of myself as a dancer, even though I haven't performed um, in over a year and I haven't danced in over a year. Um, it's been such a big part of my life. And the body is just the place where I begin. It's, it's the most central thing available to me. And I think it's always the sense of finding one center and finding oneself because you keep losing yourself along the way. And it feels to me that the better you know your body, the better you might know yourself. And I feel that we're estranged in some ways and we have to make an effort. And like you said, there are so many social, cultural, uh, so much conditioning and so much policing going around uh, around the uh, the notion of bodies and, and not just female bodies, all bodies, you know? Uh, so there's so much shame attached to the idea of body, so much fear attached to the idea of body. And I suppose part of me, because I've used the, because I've used the, one second, sorry. I'm doing an interview. Sorry about that, that was my mom asking about tea. <laughs> Um, uh, just a bit of slice and real life in, in between. Uh, yeah, I think that that sense of joy of body or um, celebration of body and how we can find that and how that can bring us to other things of the world. So that's really important. But I also don't want to just glorify the body as this thing that doesn't have any pain connected to it so you know um, that sense of the body that's aging the body that's decaying all of these things are, are part of life and I think that they they necessarily become part of the poems because the work as a dancer has been so much about the mystery of the body and trying to understand it and and appreciating and in even some sense worshiping the idea of what the body can what the human body can actually do and what it does for us daily without us even knowing um all the all the invisible things that that go on inside wow yeah absolutely and how yeah i mean you just put it beautifully <laughs> um exactly um, since um, your mum just, we just uh, heard from your mum, <laughs> um, I was actually going to ask, so we're obviously a Welsh festival, and I was actually yes. um, exchanging emails with Mena Elvin um, yesterday, and she was like, oh, you're speaking to Tashani, I'm writing a poem for her mum, and... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called Ira from Madras or something like that or like Ira in Madras um which for people who don't speak Welsh Ira means snow um yeah. and um, so it's good and so I was wondering about sort of your relationship with Wales and um I think one of in one of your poems you say um uh, the past is a yard in Wales or something along those lines and there is this um Wales crops up a few times and I was wondering um how yeah what your relationship with Wales is and in particular with sort of thinking about language and um maybe the languages that um you grew up speaking and grew up around and like how language interacts with um place as well mm. yeah um I think for me well that's so sweet Mena who's <laughs> never met my mother but seems to have this this idea of her and, and a connection with her because through me, I guess, um, I love that. Um, I think that, true. yeah, for me, Wales is, is this place that, that is a place of elsewhere and it belongs to me and yet I feel I could never be 100% part of it. But, you know, having said that, I feel that about all places, including India, I'm, I'm, I, I, I feel like I'm always somewhat outside mm -hmm. but I feel like it makes claim to a lot of places and Wales is one of those um, so my mother grew up in North Wales and she grew up speaking Welsh and um, but she didn't speak it to us and you know growing up my father's mother tongue is Gujarati and my mother is Welsh so they spoke in English and then we spoke English at home so um, I think you know, Wales is a place that I've been going to uh, on a somewhat regular basis. And I've always looked at it through this, um, 
through this prism of memory because uh, I would go to this village where my mom grew up called Nerquist, which is um, near Chester. And it, it's the playground down my down the road from my nine and tides house that I remember going to as a child and feeling there because it was summertime and because we didn't have summers like that in India where the nights went on you know being so bright so late mm -hmm. um, and it just felt this whole expansion of time that could happen in summer in Wales mm -hmm. where I imagine meeting my mother as a child at that playground and and seeing because I think it was just such a disconnect for me to see our life in India and to see this village in Wales and to just think what it must have been like for my mother to have come from there and make her life in in, in you know in 1969 when she arrived on Guy Fawkes Day and I think um, and and has continued to make her life here and and for me there's there's such a there's so much that's different, but you know, I, I wrote a little bit about it in the Pleasure Seekers in my first novel about how when you think about it, there are so many similarities because I would have my aunties, my Welsh aunties ask me, you know, when are you going to get married and all of that stuff. And my, my Indian aunties would be asking the same question. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you realize that actually in some ways I thought my, my parents came from similar families, which were, you know, my mother was definitely working class and uh, quite religious and um, had never been anywhere, you know, had never moved out of Wales. And then they had these four children who were all very cosmopolitan, um, who went off everywhere, including my mother. And, and then my father, the same, you know, um, from a very humble family, first person to go on a plane, first person to go and do the studies abroad, mm -hmm. and then how they make this life from there. So to me, Wales is a place of um, mystery. It's a place of ancestry. It's a place of poetry and song. And it's a place in the midst somehow where when I'm there, I feel somewhat connected to the landscape. But again, it's always, as a kind of outsider who's longing to get to know it better. I think that's so interesting. It's come up a few times this festival about the concept of um, when do you feel longing and sort of when do you feel for a place really strongly and it's often when you aren't in that place. You know, when it's... Um, a diaspora writing or it's um you know about something that's been in a sort of different sense like in sort of a colonial some of the colonial stories are often about actually that being taken from you and in this way that when you when you don't have um if you're sort of rooted in a place you don't necessarily think very much about that place um in the same way um and I think it's because it's part of your daily rhythms um and I think that there's an interesting um conversation in all of that um you mentioned that you um grew up speaking English and then do you also speak and um, Gujarati um and I was wondering about you all, do you always write in English? Like, sort of what's your relationship with, with languages and um, with sort of being, you know, living in India and writing mostly in English? Um, and you've also been translating to Italian. Yeah. I, did, I don't uh, speak Gujarati. I heard a lot of Gujarati when I was growing up, but I never spoke it. I was scared. My, my relationship with language is one of fear. Uh, mm. And that's all languages. Um, but English is the one that I'm most comfortable in because that's my main language, my only one in a way. I learned Hindi in school and Tamil and I can read and write to some proficiency level, but it's not fluent. Not like I can't, I'm not going to write my next book in Hindi, you know. Mm. Uh, uh, so, and, and I'm married to an Italian and for the last you know 11 years more than that I've been around Italian and it's, I'm I'm unable to just dive into language and everybody says just just you know just speak just speak and I think it's really um, a strange strange um, barrier on my part where whereby I want to know a language so fluently before I begin 
to mm-hmm. use it and and I know this uh, that that psychologically this is a problem and I should just get over it but it's just wired into me and so um, I think I've made my peace with that in some way I read a lot in translation and I'm you know I'm starting I've got the Duolingo on my phone <laughs> <laughs> I do a bit of Italian, but I just feel like I've accepted that 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 it's not going to come naturally to me. This idea of that that I've actually been listening to all these languages, and just because you don't speak it doesn't mean that you have some proficiency for it. Because language is not just about what you hear and what you say. It's 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 other worlds that you enter, and and I feel like I have access. to the world of italian to the world of hindi mm-hmm. to the world of tamil because if i'm in a room and listening i understand a lot so i may not speak but my my level of understanding is high and so i feel like that's something um and i i wish i were more brave with languages i really do me too me too i think it's one of those things i'm not naturally good at and i don't like not, not being naturally good at something um and it take yeah i completely um empathize with that experience <laughs> um and also like that's come up a few times this idea of um it's another world i think that's something that drives me as part of the festival really that um a language is not a sort of replacement of one word with another it's a whole it frames everything about how you think and what you um then do yeah um as ending you've sort of written a little bit about um dangerous poetry and um you know i think i would say that you are um a dangerous poet <laughs> and i was wondering if you could sort of explain what that means to you and what the importance of um writing dangerous poetry is yeah um i think that i feel at some level that um there is a lot to a lot at stake with with poetry and you know in this particular context i was writing a poem uh, for um, a poet called varavara rao in india who writes in telugu and who has been jailed as a you know uh, under a law of sedition basically in india and um because of his poetry and there are a lot of people like that um and it's interesting that english language poets are considered kind of elitist and kind of useless like nobody really it's not threatening you know <laughs> so you you are kind of in a different category and so in the poem i write and i want to be a dangerous poet because i feel that um i feel that there's a reason why over the centuries poets have been jailed and um basically tortured by their states because words do have a words have meaning words have weight words can change people's minds and poetry has that sense of incantation it has that sense of force and i think uh, as a poet i'm trying to say well look these are the things that i think are important and i don't want to be just shouting in the wind i want somebody to hear me do you know um and i want the poem to do something and i don't expect the poem to change laws or to you know say yes we're going to have different legislative laws because this poem has been written i don't think it works like that but i think it's something more fundamental that poetry is something that can last and can it can change your life as a reader it can affect you in in a very powerful way and i think i'm i'm saying in some way that that's the kind of poetry that you want to be writing and that you want to be reading the, the poems that have that electrical charge um so so yeah i think a little bit about wanting to write about the things or the topics or the concerns that are um that are dangerous you know um so if you're a poet in burma myanmar at the moment you know they're being uh detained some of them have been killed it's dangerous to be a poet it has been dangerous to be poets in these places because they talk against the regime and i feel like 
I'm interested in looking at um, that notion of the poet's uh, place in society in a way and and what it is the poets speak and why it's important to listen mm. it's interesting um the idea that you sort of what you some of what you're saying early on in that answer is something that I noticed that I feel like you write with a reader in mind um would you say that's true like do you write sort of um knowing wanting this to be read in a way that some other poets might say I write for myself or sort of not that you don't do both um but like there's a certain sense in which um my colleague Will said that he felt that he was like you made him bring himself to the book and to engage with your personal philosophy in a way that um is very sort of like it's there to be read <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not gentle mm. that somebody is reading it that is part of how it was conceived mm, that's really interesting I don't know I think um, again that 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 idea of the reader has really changed over so many years and partly it's to do with the fact of doing so many performances and being somebody who goes on stage and shares work in the distant past, not recently, <laughs> but you know, um, being in a room, having that embodied experience, and and realizing that actually, oh, these are the people who read my poems, these are my readers, and and trying to build a bridge towards them so that we may meet in the poem. Um, but I'm thinking about my dance teacher Chandralekha and what she would say about her audience, um, and she would always say um, that she. She always started with a lot of silence in the beginning and giving people time to kind of leave the, the noise of the world behind. And then she would say, I don't want the audience to lean back in their chairs and watch. I want them to engage in their spine in the way that the dancers are engaging in their spine. I want them to sit up in their chair and lean forward and watch. So it's not a passive sitting back entertain me kind of experience of watching her dance it is a oh what's that let me sit up oh what's happening let me look you know and moving towards and I think in some way I would say that because of so much of training in that in that way of thought maybe that has leaked into the poems as well that the poems are seen as a kind of wanting the reader to come towards me as well in some way maybe yeah yeah it's quite um uh again connections isn't it it comes back to that sort of sense of connecting um yourself with the poem with the reader mm. I um, I haven't noticed um just before this talk I was on your website and I saw that you'd written a poem for um about or sort of inspired by um Joseph Albert's um work and sort of a, a, a work of, in particular called Squares of his and um Joseph Albert's I I also have a deep love for and in so many ways has sort of I have a really distinct memory of like coming across his work um in Phoenix actually in Arizona in the Heard Museum there and like I genuinely think that started um, a love of mine with colours he uses with oranges and with sort of um all of that and I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about that poem <laughs> as it seems <laughs> Yeah, well, actually, that was a sort of commission poem about the Wayne McGregor Dance Company. And um, and Wayne had been very deeply influenced by Joseph Albers and his his color theories and this, you know, the the homage to the squares and all of those squares. And and so he had invited different poets to look at the choreography and respond in poems for the program notes, which I thought was a wonderful idea. This was a, a little while ago, and I remember. So it's an it was an exercise in ecstasy in some way because you have on one level a poet responding to movement and music and bodies on stage, but that has been influenced by these squares and colors of of Joseph Albers, and so the poem is kind of it 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 takes off from there, and it, I, I love I love. Um, uh, ecstatic poems. I, I think there's something 
very uh, you know uh, i don't know it it exists on many levels and there are many many ways to enter and leave it and i think in some ways you have the idea of music in some way you have the idea of shape and geometry and bodies and all of that come together in the poem in some way so yeah it 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 it's always um it's always interesting to see what is going to to begin the poem in that sense when it's not a poem about you know something that you choose but something that you are asked to respond to mm. Yeah. Um, would you mind um, reading a couple of poems for us now? And, um, maybe see, see um, how in turn um, we respond to them. Um, sure. Um, do you have poems that you'd like me to read or should I just pick a um, couple? It, entirely up to you entirely up to you I can suggest a couple if you want but um, please please pick whatever you'd fancy reading. Okay, well, you mentioned the one, you, I think you mentioned self, so I think I might read that one, and then I might read uh, Dresses Like a Field, because it has a reference to Wales. Dresses so, Like a Field is one um, I lovely. Okay. Thank you. A dress is like a field. A dress is like a field. Lift a hem and flowers will fall. Fold it in a wooden chest and weeds will lay their fingers against its cotton heart. A dress is thin. Take Marilyn. Take Subway Great. Take, you must have had to paint that on you. Flamenco ruffle, zipper, Cleopatra in gold, lame, little, black, something. When we were girls, we played at dressing up. Mom's swimsuit with a built-in bosom a lesson in seduction. The past is a yard in Wales. My mother and her sister in matching seersucker frock, hands in pockets, high collars, the wind making petticoats of their hair. They join a ship of sisters, mothers with needles and thread, holding bolts of cloth against their chests, thinking this will do, this will sail them across the years. A singer sewing machine in Madras. My sister and I in handmade smocks with floral bibs and frills. Aspiring zazus with high socks and lacunas of knees. If I had daughters, I'd dress them in velvet suits with cummerbunds so they could roll down meadows and scorch the wilds of their insides against grass. A dress needs only a mosquito net to be a bride and later as it yellows in a bag, it will dream of being a factory girl, a school child, something lumpen and uniform, to recognize itself in the other. The dress never loses its sense of the dramatic. It knows how to languish across a washing line, how to beckon from a mannequin, how to sit puddled on a floor. See, this riverbank, there is a row of them, unbelted unbuttoned. The river calls for an afternoon of love, a picnic, clots of copper maple, legs of bone, seams turned towards the sun. Nothing like abandoned shoes which glow with horror. The piles at Dachau, trains, gunshots, dead bodies in water. A dress is a forest of memory its damask skin, its armpits of toil and wonder. Even the holes are altars to fairy tales, reminding you how once you were so small, once your waist was a secret nation. And um, this is self. And when they ask, what kind of animal would you be? I always say gazelle or lark, never cockroach, even though they'll outlast us all. Once I dreamed I had a body with two heads, like those ancient figures from the Zarka River, with human eyes, trunks of reed and hydrated lime, built thick and flat without genitals, 
nothing shameful to eject except tears. We all want to be monuments, but can't help shoving our fingers in dirt. Imagine a life in childhood, one face to the womb, another to the future. What we remember is the road, peering through a lattice at dusk, the trauma of burial. Will we have terracotta armies to take us through? Will we be alone with the maggots? How good the rain is after a failed romance. Never mind the muddy bloomers. We are appalled by life and still, any chance we get, we emerge from the earth like cicadas to sing and fuck for a moment of triumph. The shock we carry is that the world doesn't need us. Even so, we go collecting parts, an afternoon by the sea. A game of hopping on and off scales, nose low to the ground, looking for that other glove to complete us. Here I am, globe, spinning planet. Tell me, why are you not astonished? Thank you so much. Um, that was really beautiful. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, Thank and you. More generally, I just wanted to say that um, obviously India has been going through such a um, difficult time at the moment to understate it. And I just wanted to thank you for taking the time um, today to speak to me more generally. Um, I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to Tashani and to everyone for watching um, we hope you that enjoyed today's talk um, and there are all the links down below to buy Tashani's books and to sort of any see any other talk that you would like to at the festival please do check out our program and um, we also have a Patreon if anybody is able to support and um, that is much appreciated and I hope you have a lovely rest of your day goodbye